What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook. Welcome back to another Crafted Workshop video. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to build this walnut and hard maple mid-century modern crib. I built this for my wife and I's first kid who we we're expecting on April 22nd. Super excited to have this finished. I love the way it came out and I love that I was able to build the crib for our first child. I think it's just a really special project and something that I think that will be in our family for a long, long time. Also, before we get started with today's video, I just want to mention that this video is sponsored by Blue Apron and the first 50 people to sign up using the link in the video description below will get $40 off their first two weeks of Blue Apron. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the build. After doing a ton of research on crib designs and the requirements that go along with cribs, I decided to model my crib after a commercially available design from Duck Duck, a furniture company based in Connecticut. By modeling my design after a crib that was already on the market, I knew that the design would meet the crib standards laid out by the CPSC and keep my kids safe. I used a combination of rough hard maple and walnut for this build, so my first step was to break down the lumber into rough pieces. I started with the spindles since I knew they'd be one of the most time consuming parts of the build because there were just so many of them, 54 in total. After cutting the boards to rough length at the miter saw and squaring up one edge at the jointer, I started ripping the boards at the table saw. The final spindle size is 3 quarters of an inch by 3 quarters of an inch, so I first ripped my 8 quarter boards into strips and then turned them on their sides and ripped them again to get the rough spindles. Once all the spindles were ripped, I let them rest for a few days to allow any movement to occur, and then planed them down to their final size at the planer. After milling the spindles down to their final size, I got my router table set up with a half round router bit to turn these spindles into 3 quarter inch dowels. Or at least I tried to do that. All right, so after messing around on this router table for a good bit of time, I am going to throw in the towel on trying to turn these square sticks into perfect dowels. I don't know what's going on, but you know, I have a 3 8 inch radius half round bit and I have exact 3 quarter inch by 3 quarter inch stock, but for whatever reason, it's still leaving a flat spot on the top and bottom of the dowel. I'm gonna stop wasting this maple because at this point, these are basically garbage, and I'm going to move on to plan B, which is gonna be creating tenons on the ends of all these sticks over the table saw using a dado stack, and then adding a round over to the edges to kind of get something in between a dowel and this kind of perfectly square piece of stock. I think it'll still look really good. I can use traditional mortise and tenon joinery, and I just think it's gonna to come together a lot better. Before cutting the tenons onto the ends of the spindles, I needed to cut them to their final lengths, which I did at the miter saw. And having a stop block set up here is absolutely critical, since the spindles all need to match perfectly for everything to come together correctly. With the spindles at their final length, I moved over to the table saw and got my dado stack set up to cut the tenons. This is a pretty simple process, I just needed to dial in the height of the dado stack to 3 16 of an inch to create the 3 8 of an inch tenon I wanted. I set up a stop block on my miter gauge so that I'd end up with a 1 inch long tenon and cut away the extra material on all four sides of the spindle until I was left with my finished tenon. And I just rinsed and repeated at each end of all 54 spindles and you can imagine that I got pretty tired of cutting these tenons by the time I was done. Once all the tenons were cut, I set up an eighth inch radius roundover bit on my router table and added a roundover to all four edges on the spindles. I used a few feather boards to keep consistent pressure on the bit as I fed the spindles through, and they turned out just about perfect. Also, one tip, turn your router speed down when working with maple to help prevent burning. I got basically no burning on this project, and I think this helped a lot. With the spindles finished, I could move on to the rails, which were also made of rough hard maple, which meant more milling. I got one face and one edge flat at the jointer and then ripped the boards into strips at the table saw. I made sure to leave plenty of extra materials on the rails so that I could go back and re-flatten the pieces after letting them settle out for a few days, which I did off camera. This leaves you with dead flat pieces that are much easier to deal with when it comes time for cutting joinery. Speaking of which, the next step was to get the mortises cut into the rails to accept the tenons on the spindles. Before doing that, I cut the rails to their final length at the miter saw. Next, I clamped the four side rails together and started laying out the mortise locations. This is pretty simple since the mortises are centered on the rails lengthwise and are spaced evenly along the length of the rails with two inches between each spindle. Once the mortise locations were laid out, I could move over to the hollow chisel mortiser to cut the mortises. And in case you aren't familiar with a hollow chisel mortiser, imagine a drill press with a specialized bit that cuts square holes. 
These bits consist of two pieces, the hollow chisel, which cuts the square walls of the mortise, and the drill bit, which clears away the majority of the waste from the mortise. These machines can be picked up on Craigslist for pretty cheap depending on the model, and they are indispensable on a project like this. To cut the mortises, I first aligned the fence on the hollow chisel mortiser so that the bit was centered on the rail, and then just lined up the bit with the mortise location I had laid out before. I clamped the rail in place before cutting each mortise, and used my dust extractor to collect the chips created during the cutting process. This process goes surprisingly fast once the machine is dialed in, and I think I was able to cut all the mortises on the rails in less than two hours. That's 108 mortises. I can't imagine doing that nearly as quickly with any other method, and you can see how clean of a hole you're left with after mortising. After cutting the mortises into the rails, I went ahead and rounded over the four long edges with the same eighth inch radius roundover bit. Before gluing the spindles into the rails, I went ahead and sanded all four sides of the spindles and rails up to 120 grit, since it'd be a lot easier to do this prior to the glue up. The glue ups went pretty uneventfully, I just made sure not to use too much glue so that I could avoid as much squeeze out as possible, and I made sure to apply even clamping pressure so that there were no gaps between the spindles and the rails. While I'm gluing up the panels, let's talk about the sponsor of this week's video, Blue Apron. With our new kit on the way, getting fresh and healthy meals on the table every day is going to be a challenge, and I plan to use Blue Apron to help my family create delicious recipes at home. Blue Apron has a wide variety of recipes with eight different recipes to choose from every week, so there's always something to fit any picky eater's taste buds. All of the ingredients are delivered in a refrigerated box, fresh from the farm, individually packaged in the right proportions. Each box comes with a recipe card that walks you through the cooking process step by step, and all of Blue Apron's meals can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. The first 50 people to sign up using the link in the video description below will get $40 off their first two weeks of Blue Apron, and big thanks to Blue Apron for sponsoring this week's video. Once the glue had dried on the rails and spindles, I could go ahead and get the joinery cut to attach the side rails to the top and bottom rails. First, I cut the side rails to final length at the miter saw. Next, I created reference lines for the domino, which I'll be using for the joinery on this step. That said, if you don't have a domino, you could use a hollow chisel mortiser to create the mortises, or you could use something like dowel joinery instead. I used 10 by 50 millimeter dominoes for this build and just made sure to follow my layout lines, and I'm always surprised at how quickly this process goes. After cutting the mortises, I did a test fit and the side rails fit perfectly. Before gluing the side rails onto the top and bottom rails, I needed to drill the holes for the bolts which will hold the crib together. Most cribs are too large to fit through standard doorways, so it's really important to make cribs easy to take apart and put back together. Let's take a second to look at the 3D model to see how the crib sides come together, just to give you a better idea of what I'm doing here. The sides of the crib are attached to the head and footboard sections, and then those sections are attached to the legs. And I'm using quarter 20 stainless steel bolts, and I'm tapping the wood to accept the bolts. First, I needed to drill a recessed hole for the bolt head to sit below the surface of the wood, and I used a 3 quarter inch Forstner bit for this. How far the hole is recessed will really depend on your bolt length, but these holes were half an inch deep. After creating the recess, I swapped to a drill bit sized so that the bolt would drop through snugly and drilled a through hole. And the nice thing about using a Forstner bit first is it leaves a center mark from the point of the bit, so it's really easy to center your through hole within the recess. Next, I needed to create some locating pins so that the sides would come together precisely when reassembled. Again, I used dominoes for this, but dowels would be another great option. And these locating pins also take some of the load off of the bolts and makes this joint a lot stronger. After adding the dominoes, I temporarily assembled the pieces and marked the location of the through holes onto the mating piece. And this is where the tapped holes needed to be created. Using the locations I marked, I pre-drilled the holes for the tapped holes at the drill press, which I'll tap a little later. With the last of the holes drilled, I could finally move on to assembly. I added glue to each of the mortises and then added a domino to each, and I made sure to wipe away any squeeze out before putting everything together since it's a lot easier to do then, and then added some clamps. After the glue dried, I went ahead and sanded off any squeeze out and then rounded over the rest of the edges to match the other edges, again using the 8th inch radius roundover bit. With the sides basically done, I could move on to the leg structures. And they're an open, kind of rectangular design that wraps around the ends of the sides. It's a really cool look. I decided to make the legs out of walnut to get a nice contrast from the maple. First, I broke down the rough walnut into pieces and then flattened them on the jointer and planer. After flattening, I ripped the pieces to final width at the table saw and then cut them to their final length at the miter saw. For the joinery on the legs, I again used the domino. I used two dominoes per corner on the legs, and this provided plenty of strength. 
To assemble the legs, I just used glue and dominoes, making sure to wipe away any glue squeeze out, and then clamped everything together. After the glue dried, I marked the locations of the tapped holes using the head and footboards for reference. After marking the holes, I used a cinder punch to keep the bit from wandering, and then pre-drilled the holes. To tap the holes, I used the Wood Whisperer thread taps, which I've used in the past with a lot of success. These threads are incredibly strong and are super simple to tap. I used a piece of painter's tape to mark the depth and then just ran the tap in and out using a drill. While I had the tap chucked in my drill, I went ahead and tapped the other holes on the head and footboards as well. The last pieces to create for the crib were the mattress supports, which are really simple. The mattress support rails are made up of two pieces of hard maple, which I cut to rough size at the table saw and then milled down to final size on the jointer and planer. The two support rail pieces are glued together to form a little ledge for the mattress slats to sit in, and this keeps the slats from moving around or falling off. Once the glue dried, I drilled a recessed hole for another stainless steel bolt, again using a Forstner bit for the recess and a twist bit for the through hole. Next, I decided on the height of the mattress support and marked exactly where the holes would go on the sides of the crib, and then drilled and tapped the holes. I only added hole locations for two mattress heights, but I can always go back and add more later if I need to. The last pieces to make for the crib were the mattress support slats, which I cut from some scrap pieces of walnut. I had a few pieces of this walnut I had picked up off of Craigslist a while back that had some really weird coloring and weren't really usable for much else, but were perfect for this application since they won't be seen in the final piece. With all the pieces finished, I sanded everything up to 180 grit to prep for finish. I made sure any rough edges were sanded smooth, as the last thing I wanted was my kid getting a splinter from my crib. For the finish on this project, I used Rubio Monocoat, which is a 0% VOC finish and is food safe after seven days of cure time. I used the two-part version with the 2C accelerator, which really speeds up the cure time, and I'll have a link to the exact finish I used in the video description below in case you're interested. The best part about Monocoat, as the name implies, is that it only needs a single coat. I just wiped on the coat using a rag, let it sit for a few minutes to react with the wood, and then wiped off the excess. With the finish applied, I could finally bring the crib into the nursery and assemble it in its final home. Before assembling, I added a little message to my child on one of the slats just to commemorate the build. Since the gender of our kid is a surprise, I left the name area blank, which I'll add once he or she is born in the next few weeks. Assembly was really simple, I just threaded in all the bolts using an allen key, dropped in the slats, and added the mattress. And with that, the crib was done. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I really love the way this came out. Again, this is not my own original design. This is based on a commercial design, but I love that I was able to reproduce it pretty accurately. Love the way it came out. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I won't be selling plans or anything for this project since again, it's somebody else's design. I will go ahead and upload the SketchUp file I created of the project just in case you guys wanna pull measurements from that or anything like that. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. Again, I wanna thank Blue Apron for sponsoring this week's video. If you guys wanna help support me, support my sponsors. They allow me to keep doing this week to week and do this for a living. Also, if you don't already, go ahead and get subscribed. I put out new project videos like this pretty much every week. Also go ahead and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss any of my new videos. And last, I have a list of all the tools and materials I used in the video description below. All right, thanks for watching everybody. And until next time, happy building.